Hey guys, before we get started, just a quick shout out to Boksu. They're actually not paying me to say this, I just legit think that this service of traditional regional snacks combined with a cultural booklet in every box deserves all the love it can get. It is my jam, and I think it would be for you as well. So if you want to check it out for yourself, use that description link and 10% discount code Gaijin10 to get your folk fused goodies today. Hey everyone, Gaijin Goomba here. It's here, it's here, it's finally freaking here! Ghost of Tsushima Legends is here! Okay, well, let me back up for a second. You know the record-shattering PS4 game Ghost of Tsushima, right? Developed by Sucker Punch and told as a historical fictional tale of the first Mongol invasion of Japan and the topic of multiple videos on this channel? So yeah, the devs just dropped a brand new multiplayer expansion, Ghost of Tsushima Legends, that steps a bit away from the historical side of things and just goes head first into the deep end of Japan's fictional folklore featuring Oni, Tengu, and other iconic monsters. So how could I not be immediately in love with this? Well, I'll tell you how. After spending hours of leveling the different classes in the game and experiencing the new game world, I can't help but be utterly confused by this expansion. Now, don't get me wrong, this game mode, which is free by the way, is a superb addition to the core game. No loot boxes, no gotcha, everything is earned. The nine chapters of the two-player story are extremely varied, the survival game mode loop is frenetic and engrossing, and I can only imagine how insane the raids are going to be in this game, but this game's story makes no freaking sense. Like. I have no effing clue how Legends pulls its story and characters from culturally charged tales, where the single player is very very much rooted in a more realistic depiction of the Mongol invasion, Legends goes off the freaking rocker with fantasy folklore, which look, as a yokai enthusiast I appreciate immensely, but there is no connection between the creatures Sucker Punch borrows for this game and the stories of these creatures from folklore. Well, I fail to see how that's a bad thing. Sucker Punch is probably just wanting to do a completely different story with yokai. I mean, that's what Lafcadio Hearn did, and he became an international yokai celebrity. It's not bad, it's just... <sighs> I'm reminded of Yahtzee's zero punctuation review of The Evil Within, when he talks about some company suit telling a developer to make a game about, quote, horror with no context of story. All of the elements that Sucker Punch use in Legends are all taken from Japanese folklore, but lacking any sort of consistency with the stories that they pull from. Sort of the opposite of what Neo 2 does, and oh yeah, we'll get to that game's DLC story in Yokai soon enough, but for now, let me explain what I mean. First, there's the little things, like the Oni chest for example. On the latch you can obviously see a No Hanya mask, a mask representing a female No character that turned into an Oni out of spite, jealousy, or rage, but if you look around to the back, the body of the chest is a Saisen, a Shinto offering box for Kami that you see at Shrine, so what's the connection, cause these are kinda like polar opposites. It just seems like two elements that got wrapped up together. Yeah, but you've also got stuff like the Assassin's variety of masks, which cover everything from Kitsune to Kappa to a huge plethora of Oni, to even what look like corrupted Buddhist deities with the multiple faces and crowns. Considering how a good number of Shinobi no Mono like the Kumo Gakure Ryu would use masks to hide their identities and jump scare their enemies, that's not so out of the ordinary, is it? No, but then you've got the Tori Gates in Legends. Now, in Shinto, Tori Gates mark the exit of the secular world and the entrance into the sacred world of the Kami. That's why it can feel really serene and peaceful to visit a shrine, because the local people take that sacredness really, really seriously. In Legends, they tend to be coiled up in what looks like mucus, muck, blood, or tissue, stuff that, in Shinto, creates impurities called kegare. Which, yeah, it makes sense for the story to a degree considering we're dealing with corrupting yokai and oni, but at the same time, it feels just like a hand-wavy method of getting players from one section of the game to the next, rather than having any sort of role as a gateway between mundane and supernatural worlds. Eh, seems kinda nitpicky if you ask me, cause you've also got stuff like the Ronin Spirit Dog, which protects and attacks enemies. Something that goes very hand-in-hand -hand with how dogs and wolves are seen in Japan. See, back in the day, there really wasn't much of a word that separated wolf from dog. They were both just kinda called Olkan. And wolf spirits were said to be protectorate animals against everything from crop-destroying creatures like monkeys and boars to malicious spirits themselves. They are one of the great natural protectors of the people. So, having the spirit-attuned Ronin class possessing a spirit dog makes a ton of sense culturally. Alright, we're going in circles here. So, let me just break down the nine different story missions and show you what I mean about all this weird continuity. Also, story spoilers for anyone who hasn't first-hand experienced the plot of this and wants to. Chapter 1, Severed Hearts. The plot of this particular chapter involves undead Mongol husks hunting down twins within the population of Tsushima and harvesting their hearts to make unkillable soldiers tethered to a comrade. Now, this plot basically is there to introduce the game mechanic of enemies that have to be simultaneously killed or they self-res. 
but at the same time I'm thinking, why hearts? Like, the only thing I understand about the heart in Shinto is that the overall goal for practitioners is to achieve Magokoro, or pure sincere heart, something that only the Kami can give, and even then, the word heart in this context is more of the spirit, where Shinzo is the organ of the heart itself. All I could really do is think to myself, why not use livers? Because when it comes to old school folk stories, it seemed every yokai on the block wanted a human liver. Now, for whatever reason, ancient Japanese medicines claimed that liver, fresh or dried, had all manner of cure-all properties. And for dozens of different yokai, it was believed that eating a human liver, particularly the liver of a virgin or a baby due to purity, was said to give that yokai insane levels of power. Maybe they were going for more Western relatable concepts? I mean, no one stateside is going to understand the power of livers, where hearts seem to be the weak point for a lot of different folklore monsters in the West. I mean, I could give that a pass for sure, but here's the thing. There is one particular yokai who was born out of the need for baby livers, the Oni Baba, which just so happens to be the focus of the next chapter and the rest of the game. Chapter 2 introduces Legend's Big Bad, Iyo the Oni Baba, an old hag of Akijo who's manipulating the Mongols and wicked Tsushima citizens to rally behind her in exchange for eternal life and power. But here's the thing, Oni Baba didn't do that. Like, ever. Granted, there are a ton of different Onibaba in No, Kabuki, and other facets of Japanese folklore, but they were always isolated, never caring for much anything save for the territory that they claimed, such was the case of Yamauba, or they had a deep-seated grudge against the family that abandoned them to the wilds to die. Hey, back then people had to decide which mouth to feed had to go, a baby or an elderly mother. Thus, their resentment and hatred to their family transformed them into Onibaba. But really, the only story I could recall where an Onibaba had any sort of long-term plan was Kurozuka, the demon hag of Adachigahara. Long story short, Kurozuka started off as the nanny of a wealthy family who had a sickly daughter. Doctor said the five-year-old girl needed a fresh, unborn baby's liver to be cured. So, the nanny went out searching for someone who was willing to give up their child's life for a fresh liver, but to no avail. See, I told you, man, it's all about those livers. Eventually, the nanny got tired of asking and just decided to ambush the next pregnant woman that she found in Adachigahara. Years had passed at this point, and many more still followed. That is until one night, a pregnant woman was walking down the road, whom the nanny slew and took the liver out of their unborn child, only to realize she just murdered the young, sickly daughter, now a grown woman, that she was tasked to save by mistake. Insanity and grief pushed her over the edge, and she became the Onibaba of the Black Mountains. She did not, in contrast, turn into a megalomaniacal supervillain bent on nationwide subjugation. None of them did. So, I can't help but question the reasoning, it seems like she would have made a far better henchman like a Neo. I mean, the literal list just goes on and on. Chapter 3 of The Veil Between Worlds, the Mongols somehow figured out how to drain ki out of not just any kami, but Amaterasu, Tsukuyomi, and Susano, three of the most powerful kami in the 8 million strong pantheon. And somehow, this key gives them elemental resonance, which is a massive pain to deal with in-game. But that's neither how ki or kami work. I mean, the closest thing that you could get to are Omamori charms, which are said to contain the essence of the kami at the shrine where the charm was purchased, but no one has been able to sap kami of power, especially not three of the most powerful kami, and especially not foreigners. Even if the Mongols succeeded in game, that means the sun, moon, and weather would essentially cease to exist, thus dooming not only Japan, but all of life itself, kinda backfiring Io's plans for a nationwide dominance. Chapter 4, The Tale of Utsune. It's just more of the idea of foreign Mongols stealing power from Kami, though instead of having to visit small shrines, you get Uchitsune's bow, which disempowers the interlopers. Chapter 5, The Crow Demons of Otsuna. Quote, Mongols conspire with the Crow Demons to take a village in Kubata, end quote. Dude, Tengu freaking hate outsiders. Their tales talk about kidnapping and attacking people who trespass in their mountain homes, and those are Japanese folks that are being ambushed. I can only imagine how much Tengu would hate having foreign invaders in their forest. Though the Tengu in game look absolutely freaking amazing, and yeah, you would absolutely see this many crows hang out with Karas Tengu and Dai Tengu, Tengu would never consort with outsiders. They're too busy either corrupting Buddhist monks into Tengu Do or training the most skillful swordmen in the country. Chapter 6 Caravan of Thieves. Mongols steal sacred artifacts to use for quote profane purposes, which turns out to be a statue of Monju Bosatsu, Bodhisattva of Wisdom, indicative of the five knots on top of their head. Interesting poll? But we later find out that some Mongol had actually been sealed into the statue for years, if not generations, which makes no freaking sense considering the timeline of the Mongol invasion. 
Plus, I have never heard of someone sealing an evil spirit in a sacred Buddhist statue, because that seems super sacrilegious. Chapter 7, The Stranded Dead, and while we're at it, Chapter 8, Tides of Battle. Basically, some Mongol shaman named Sukbatar, or as we like to call him in the community, Suck Butter, finds a way to create and control Ondo vengeful ghosts after slaughtering villages in Tsushima, thus creating the most agonizing enemy to fight in this freaking game, cause ya gotta love getting ambushed by invisible enemies, but more to the point, this doesn't happen. You can't just take an Ondo and control them. The closest thing to that are Inugami. Yubi. No, this Inugami, who are basically Ondo spirits of sacrificial dogs that serve families, but even that has a laundry list of to-dos that are easy to screw up. Human Ondo, though, are on a totally different level. You kill someone cruelly enough that they become an Ondo, you're freaking cursed and haunted for life. Ondo are born from pure, unadulterated vengeance. Some Onyo like Sugawara no Michizane were so freaking powerful that they pushed the very government to the brink of collapse all for revenge. So how in the world do a bunch of Mongols slaughter people so horribly they become Onyo ghosts yet still have the power to control them? And then Chapter 9, The Fire Spirits of Yarikawa. They're just Oni-themed watches with maybe a vague connection to Oboro Guruma, the yokai ox card, but that's such a stretch even I can't really buy into it. I just don't get it! Sucker Punch did such an amazing job with every single fine detail of not only Japan, not only Tsushima, not only the samurai, but all the artifacts and cultural information of the Mongols. From everything we found in our last two videos, this game was perfect! So why, for heaven's sakes, why are the supernatural aspects all over the place? Dude, <laughs> calm down. For one, it's a video game. No need to get so worked up about it. And for two, did you not piece together that all these things you just listed are the machinations of a single borderline insane blind story writer trying to make a no play? What? Oh, you poor sweet summer child. Think about it. Yozen may seem like some powerful keeper of lost mythical tales, but that's just how he looks in Legends. You know, the game mode that has no realistic bearing. Now, let's look at him in the single player game that has all of the realistic bearing. For one, the guy is actually completely blind, unable to actually see what's happening during the invasion of Tsushima. Though, give the man props, he can write while being completely blind. Though, it seems that all he cares to write about are yokai and oni. No, seriously, look at all the papers strewn about his setup. Everything is either kanji related to yokai and oni, or divine figures. All of these pages are also seen in every chapter in each mission, not only plastered on everything, but also drifting in the air. What we are essentially experiencing in Ghost Legends is a borderline crazy yokai enthusiast perception and retelling of the events of the first Mongol invasion. Though we may be missing a few details considering how forgetful Gyozen is with his own scrolls, everything we experience in Legends is coming from the mental perspective of Gyozen. All the in-game world evidence points to it. So you think this is just one man's wild ramblings trying to make a historical event more fantastical than it really is by mashing with his hyperfixation of Oni and Yokai? On the surface, perhaps, but there's one key thing missing here. Everyone in Legends, and I mean everyone, wears a mask, most of which are old-fashioned no masks at that. So would it not be out of the realm of possibility to say that this Oni-obsessed, blind, screw-loose, eccentric writer is attempting to write the next hot no-play? I mean, a large majority of them feature these exact kinds of supernatural elements within their story. Oni, Tengu, Kijo, and Oni Baba. And all of these supernatural elements are intermixed within key historic events and time periods in Japan, just like what Gyozen's doing with the Mongol invasion. That and the fact that everyone is masked in legends, including NPCs, and everyone is always masked in No leads me to that conclusion. I mean, you already mentioned No way back at the beginning of this video, so wouldn't it make sense? That? That actually isn't bad. It would make everything make a heck of a lot more sense. Huh. Well, what do you all think? Are all of these near-horror fantasy elements just Sucker Punch having fun, or is there a message here about the insanity of no production plots? Let me know in the comments below, and while you do that, I gotta give a big freaking thank you to all my patrons who let me make these crackpot cultural theories without the fear of going broke. Nuance can be hard to find these days on YouTube, but you all give me the freedom to explore it for your viewing pleasure, so thank you so, so very much for that. We've got so much content coming down the pipeline for November and December. Neo 2's historical DLC plot in Yokai, breakdown of the new beat em up slash farm sim Sakuna of Rice and Ruin, and maybe a bit of dabbling into Young Impa from Age of Calamity. So, if all of that sounds pretty tight, be sure to sub up, get notified, and don't forget we stream every Tuesday, Saturday, and Sunday at 7pm US Central Time over on Twitch. All of the games above, you will see there. 
But until next time, everyone, the Skyjin Goomba, signing out.